Good morning, everybody. It's great to see you all here today. I'm Pastor Brian. If we haven't met, I sure would love to meet you before you leave today. Here's what we're going to do today as we study today, as we study Mark chapter Mark chapter 13, verses 28 to 27. We're going to talk about when time runs out. And I want to ask a question. Most of the time this week, or this in this series, we've been starting off with a question. I want to ask a question that's kind of a weird question. I admit it's a weird question. The way I'm asking it's a weird question, but I'm trying to be provocative this morning if we haven't already been provocative enough. How would you live if you didn't believe time would run out? How would you live if you didn't believe time would run out on you? You know, these last couple of weeks in, the, in Mark 13, we've been, we've been studying about the end times. The big, the big fancy word for this is eschatology. Everyone say that. Eschatology makes you feel so smart when you say big words like that. Eschatology is the study of the end times and one of the things that the Bible says, clearly Jesus said it right here in Mark 13 and in Matthew, in Matthew 24 and in 2 Thessalonians and 1 Thessalonians and Revelation and Daniel, we've learned that time's gonna run out. This is like a biblical concept and even though it seems weird, it seems weird that time would run out, it seems like, a, again, if, 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 I didn't, if I didn't fully believe the Bible, this would be one of the things I would probably throw out because it, it just seems weird to me. This whole idea of Jesus coming back and the rapture, we studied the rapture last week, that Jesus is gonna take us to be with him. I grew up, I remember I, I grew up in the, in the days where when, whenever we would learn about the rapture and the whole idea of being left behind, for some reason in our head, it was like your clothes stayed here, but you got, you got left behind, you were taken away. Did anybody, anyone else grow up like that? Where, because, and I don't, the Bible doesn't say that your clothes are going to stay behind necessarily, but for that, for whatever reason, that's how all the movies depict it. So we used to play tricks on our siblings. If I got home from school before they did, I would, I would like put a pile of my clothes on the couch and I would like hide in the closet and let's see, let's see if they freaked out. Like, no, I got left behind. Anyway, well, what if you believe that that wasn't a thing? What if you believe that time wouldn't run out? What if you believe that we're just here, we just live however long we live, and then we die, and we just go from dust to dust, and there is no eternity, there is no heaven, there is no hell? What if you believe that? How would you live if you believed that? Well, actually, Paul talks about that in Philippians 3. Before we get to our Mark passage, I wanna read this passage. He says this, For I've told you often before, and I say it again with tears in my eyes, that there are many whose conduct shows that they really are enemies of the cross. They're headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things. And they think only about this life here on earth. That, that's what Paul's saying. Paul's saying is there are people who live like this. There are people who only think about life here on earth. They don't think about eternity. They don't think about the second coming. They just think about life here on earth. But see, Paul is drawing a contrast from those people to people that we're supposed to be as followers of Jesus, that he says, we are citizens of heaven. Already we're citizens of heaven, even though we're not there yet. We're citizens of heaven where Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ lives. And we're eagerly waiting for him to return as our savior. Now again, I just want you to think about this passage and I want you to be honest with yourself because I think there are a lot of Christians who live like time won't run out. I think there are a lot of followers of Jesus who live more like what Paul is describing in a non-Christian. They think only about this life here on earth. I mean, be honest, do you only think about life on earth? I think this is a relatively new phenomenon. It's because we have heaven on earth in America. I think American Christians I think there's something about our lifestyle, our lack of persecution, our lack of real persecution. I think there's something about that that gets us so focused on our big screen TVs and our comfortable homes and our, like the, the lives that we get to live that truly are a blessing. I mean, we are so blessed. I think there's something about that that can lure us away from thinking about eternity. And so as we finish up Mark 13 today, I just want to challenge you, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you're a Christian, I want to challenge you to really consider that time is going to run out. Now that shouldn't freak us out as Christians. It shouldn't freak us out. 
Because it says, look, we're eagerly waiting for him to return. We should be eagerly waiting for the second coming of Christ. And we're gonna see at the end today, when we finish up, we're gonna see some other stuff about what we should do as followers of Jesus as it relates to the end times. Like we shouldn't be freaked out about the stuff we learned last week, the rapture and the tribulation and the antichrist. We shouldn't, we should, it shouldn't frighten us. It should actually spur us on. Time, according to the Bible, time's gonna run out. Not just on you and me, but on, on our friends, on our neighbors, on the family members we just had Thanksgiving with. Time's gonna run out. And I think it's really important for us to keep that in mind and we should live in light of that. And that's what we're gonna be looking at today. So let's go to the text. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Mark chapter 13, verses 28 to 31. Let's start right there. Jesus, this is Jesus speaking. This is, the, the, he's, this is called the Olivet Discourse because if you remember, Jesus is on the Mount of Olives and which kind of overlooks the temple. So he's, he's at the Mount of Olives looking, looking at the temple grounds. He just spent some time in the temple grounds doing teachings. We've been in, in this whole series talking about that. But now he's ta- talking to his disciples from the Mount of Olives, looking back across the valley, the Kidron Valley over at the temple. And here's what he says. Now learn a lesson from the fig tree. When its branches bud and its leaves begin to sprout, you know that summer is near. Let's talk about the fig tree real quick for a second. So the fig tree was different from most of the trees in Palestine, is to this day different. Most of the trees in Palestine, they don't lose their leaves in the fall. The fig tree does. It's one of the trees that does. So it loses its leaves in the fall. And then by the time spring comes along, you know, you know that, that spring is almost over when the fig tree starts to bloom. And so really what Jesus is talking about here is what I think what any of us think about in the springtime, it's, that it's all about new life. It's all about hope. You know, last week there was some scary stuff we looked at with the tribulation, but then at the end of it, we saw that Jesus is coming back. He's gonna come back on the clouds and it's gonna be all this darkness and gloom is gonna be replaced by Jesus. And so really, I think what he's speaking to here is the hopefulness that we get during springtime. I love springtime. And we should have hope when we think about these things. We shouldn't just have dread. We should have hope. And so he goes on, Jesus says, in the same way, when you see all these things taking place, you can know that his return is very near, right at the door. Now we've been, ans- though, I don't know if you remember, if you were here a couple weeks ago, the question that the disciples asked Jesus at the beginning of Mark 13 is, is when are you coming back? When is the world gonna end? And I don't know if you've been paying attention enough over the last couple of weeks, but Jesus hasn't answered the question yet. In fact, if anything, he's, he's, he's given one of those frustrating answers. And how many times do we get frustrating answers when we talk to Jesus? Because we always, we, when we pr- that's called prayer nowadays, when we pray to Jesus and we don't get what we're praying for, sometimes we can get frustrated. And so here, Jesus is, is doing this to his disciples. He's not gonna give them the answer they're hoping for. They want a time and a date. If anyone gives you a time and a day, a year and a day for the return of Jesus, don't follow that person because they're wrong. I just want you to know that. Don't follow that person. Jesus isn't giving them time and day, but he is giving, he is talking about the signs. He says, He's been, for the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at all the signs of the end times. And he says, in the same way, when you see all these things taking place, you'll know that his return is very near right at the door. But Jesus is less interested in giving them the specific details of when he's coming back. And he's more interested in teaching them how to live in light of it. And so here's what he says. I tell you the truth, this generation will not pass from the scene before all these things take place. Heaven and earth will disappear, but my words will never disappear. I wanna pause right here, and this is where I'm gonna get into my, my marker. Get ready, oh, it's so exciting, I can't wait. This, this phrase right here, I tell you the truth, this generation will not pass away from the scene before all these things take place. Critics of the Bible have used this to say, see, look, Jesus is wrong, the Bible can't be trusted. Because Jesus is saying at face value, Jesus is saying here that the end times was gonna happen during the time of the disciples. Does that make sense? This generation will, I remember reading this as a young person thinking, this is a really confusing statement. I don't understand this statement. And so for some Christians that could really challenge your faith, but I wanna just use my, my marker here to explain a couple things, a couple ways you can see this. Number one, when he says all these things, okay, here's one way to understand this. 
All these things, some commentators say this, all these things are related to the stuff that he was talking about last week about the temple being destroyed. So when he says all the, do you you remember that whenever we look at prophecy, we have to think about it in terms of the, the immediate fulfillment of a prophecy and the future fulfillment of a prophecy. A lot of times prophecies have, have this dual meaning. It's got the immediate and then it's got the future. And the immediate part of all the stuff that Jesus was talking about, if you missed last week, go back to it. But the immediate stuff is the temple would have been destroyed in AD 70 in the lifetime of Jesus' disciples. So that's actually how I view this. That's, that's the understanding that I have of this, is that when he says this generation will pass away until all these things take place. He's talking about the immediate destruction of the temple in the context of Mark 13. Now, there's another way to see it. Some some commentators view, view it like this, and they would underline this generation. And they would say, this this generation is speaking about, the. if you go back in the context of Mark 13, it's speaking about the, the generation in the last days. So some people would say that What Jesus is speaking to is when all of this stuff, the generation where all of this stuff happens will not pass away, which again, that makes sense as well because Jesus is saying that that it's 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 gonna start all this string of events that will end in the second coming of Christ. So there's two ways to understand this, but what you can't do as a follower of Jesus is to look at this and say, Jesus was wrong. You can't look at this and say Jesus was wrong. And here's what I love about this passage. Look at the last line Jesus says there. Heaven and earth will disappear, but my words will never disappear. As a follower of Jesus, we believe that the word of God is faithful and true. We can take it to the bank. And so when you come against a passage like this where it's confusing to you, I just wanna encourage you, keep studying because God's word can stand the test of time. And so we know that this is what Jesus is talking about in this passage. And he did that just so I could use those markers. All right, verse 32, here's what Jesus says next. And this is another problematic passage for some people, and I wanna explain it to you. He says, however, no one knows the day or the hour when these things will happen, not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. Only the Father knows. And And since you don't know when that time will come, be on guard, stay alert. All right, here's another one that some people are like, if you're doing your readings for this week, you're like, explain that one to me. I don't understand that either. How could it be that Jesus doesn't know when these things will happen? Isn't Jesus God? So as we understand biblical, a biblical teaching on Christology, the study of Christ, we look at this, and for some people, again, at the surface level, some people look at this and say, this is really confusing. Because you keep saying Jesus is God, but it seems like God should know that. Explain to me how no one knows the day or the hour, not even the son himself. And this goes back to what we we talked about maybe four or five weeks now where we talked about the nature of Christ, that Jesus is fully God and fully man. Jesus is 100% God and 100% man. He's not 50-50, he's not a demigod. He's not 50% God and 50% man. He's 100% God. And then at one moment in history, God took on flesh. This is what we celebrate at Christmas. God took on flesh. He made his dwelling among us. And here's what happened at that that moment. I want to read this from, from Philippians chapter two. It says, though he was God, verse six, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave slave and was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. And again, I know as we're trying to understand who Jesus is, it's so hard to, it's so hard to keep those truths in tension. It's a paradox. A paradox means there are two things that are true that seem like they're, they can't both be true at the same time. And this is the paradox of the, of the nature of Christ. He is 100% God and 100% human. And so when we read this and it says that that the son, Jesus himself doesn't even know the timing of the end, that is referring to his decision, as Paul says in Philippians 2, his decision to give up his divine privileges. That though he is fully God, he didn't stop being fully God, but he decided of his own will, he decided to temporarily give up the exercise of his attributes, all of his attributes of godhood. So he gave up, God is omniscient. 
But when Jesus took on flesh, he said, I'm gonna give up. I'm gonna give up my right to exercise my omniscience. And so when I read this, it doesn't, it doesn't make me question scripture. When I read this, it makes me worship him more. To say that he is fully God and fully man, the word for that, if you remember this, was hypostatic union, the hypostatic union, that he's fully God and fully man at the same time. And so when we read this, it doesn't have to challenge our faith. It should support it. It should encourage it. We should look at this and we say, thank you, Jesus, that you would do that for us. Thank you, Jesus, that you would give up your, you would give up, you wouldn't grasp your divinity, but instead you would come down to earth. You would still be God, but you would give up some of those attributes of your divine nature so that you could live among us and live a perfect sinless life and die for us on the cross. And by the way, it says there that only the Father knows, and that means you don't know either. So he says, he says since you don't know when that time will come, just be on guard, stay alert. This is the lesson, this is the takeaway for us, is that we need to stay alert, we need to be ready for this. And then he says this in verse 34 to 37. The coming of the Son of Man, remember that's what he called himself, the Son of Man, can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. When he left home, he gave each of his slaves instructions about the work they were to do, and he told the gatekeeper to watch for his return. Man, does this remind me of when Tracy leaves the house and she, she says to AJ, our son, she's like, Son, when I get back, your room better be clean. Is this just in our house or can I get an amen? Or is this, is this okay? We can all relate to this, right? And Jesus is saying this, you too must keep watch. And so AJ and I will be sitting there watching football and we'll hear that garage door come up. And man, if we haven't, if we haven't done our stuff, man, we are like jumping off the couch and running to get the work done. And usually I've got like a pile of clothes I sit there just so I could try to fool her into the rapture having happened. But. <laughs> but here's his point. He says, you don't know when the master of the household will return. You don't know when he's gonna come back. This is, his, this is Jesus. He's finishing up the, he's, an, he's not answering the question that they asked. He's answering the question that they should have asked. When are you gonna come back? You don't know. You'll never know. But he's saying it could be in the evening, it could be in the, at midnight, it could be before dawn or daybreak. But here's what he says. Don't let him find you sleeping when he arrives without warning. I say to you what I say to everyone. Watch for him. This is Jesus' message, not just to his disciples. It's his message to us today. If you're a follower of Jesus, here's what he says. Here's what I want you to take away out of these last three weeks as we've studied Mark 13, is watch for Jesus, be ready for Jesus, because he is coming back. Time will run out. Time will run out. I know that doesn't sound like really happy and cheerful, and, but it's the Bible, it's what the Bible says, time will run out, we better be ready. Are you ready for when time runs out? And to, to, me, it, to me, it really begs this last question, and I wanna, I wanna spend just a few minutes in 2 Peter because Peter actually, Peter at the end of his life writes a, writes a couple of letters that we have in the Bible. Now, Peter was there during Mark, the Mark 13 stuff. Peter was there. He's one of the disciples. So he heard all this stuff. He got to hear everything that Jesus said. He was one of the guys asking the questions. When are you gonna come back? When are you gonna come back? When are you gonna come back? And basically Jesus is like, I'm not gonna tell you. I don't even know. Just be ready. Just be ready. Just be ready. And at the end of Peter's life, he ends up writing 2 Peter. And here's what he says in chapter three, because Jesus hadn't come back yet. This is decades later. Jesus still hadn't come back yet. And Peter writes about it in 2 Peter 3. And I want, I want to finish today with his words. He says this, the Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. So I'm sure there were people in Peter's day at this point who are like, what gives? Jesus said he's coming back. It's been 20 years. Why hasn't he come back? And I think Peter is answering probably his own questions, but he's also answering the questions of maybe some of the other disciples, some of the other Christians who were waiting. Could you imagine Jesus saying those things in, in Mark 13 and in Matthew 24, and they're waiting and year after year after year after year, and Jesus still hasn't come back and persecution is ramping up for the Christians. And they're like, when is he gonna come back? And Peter answers, he's not being slow as some people think. And here's what he says. No, he's being patient for your sake. 
You wanna know why Jesus hasn't come back yet? Here's our answer. He doesn't want anyone to be destroyed, but he wants everyone to repent. This is why he hasn't come back. He says, the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief, just like we read about in Mark 13. So now Peter gets into his own little mini teaching on everything we just read in Mark 13. He says, the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise. The very elements themselves will disappear in fire. The earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. So, I mean, Peter's kind of, it seems like he's referring back to the tribulation, some of the stuff that he'd learned in Mark 13 from Jesus himself. So he's giving a little teaching on this, but you see what Peter's doing through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is Peter's giving us more context to understand why he hasn't come back yet. And he goes on, he says, since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should live looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. And so, dear friends, while, while you're waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in his sight. And remember, our Lord's patience gives people time to be saved. Wow, what a lesson. What a lesson for Peter to under, for Peter to put this in context probably 20 years after Jesus said these words and Peter's waiting for them to be fulfilled. He's waiting for the answer. He's waiting for Jesus to come back. I mean, he would have, I know I would have thought in Jesus' day, if I was one of the disciples, I would have thought that it was gonna happen in my lifetime. For sure, I would have thought that. And it hadn't yet. And Peter understands it's because there are more people who need to repent. It's because there are more people who need to hear the gospel. There are more people who need to hear about the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And that's true for us today, isn't it? I mean, think about it. Just zoom out on history for a second. It's been 2,000 years since Jesus said those things in Mark 13. 2,000 years, that's a long time. 2,000 years and Jesus hasn't come back yet. I, I bet you Peter would have been blown away if he knew that. Peter thought it was right around the corner. The disciples, all the disciples thought it was right around the corner. Every generation of Christians has thought it was right around the corner. You know why? It's because we need to be ready. I think Jesus wants us to think it's right around the corner. I think Jesus wants us to live like time is gonna run out. I don't think he wants us to live thinking time's not gonna run out on us or on any of our friends. Think about the people who who came over and celebrated Thanksgiving with you. Think about some of them who don't know Jesus, who are gonna die apart from Jesus and they're gonna die in their sins. Jesus is being slow not because he's not good at keeping his promises. No, he's being slow because he doesn't want anyone to perish. He's being slow because he wants everyone to be saved. He's being slow because he wants to give your family members and your friends time. So we better get busy. I mean, isn't that the takeaway? Like, snap out of it. It's like Jesus is saying, snap out of it. Pay attention because time is short. You know, the truth is, we don't know if Jesus is gonna come back on the clouds in our, in our lifetime, but I can guarantee you this. Time will run out in our lifetime. Because if Jesus doesn't come back and we die before he comes back, time run out. Time just ran out on you. Every family member, every, every loved one in your life, every neighbor, every coworker, every, every classmate, young people, like time is gonna run out on them. Everyone, everyone has a, an expiration date, every one of us does. And so for 2,000 years, this, the return of Christ hasn't happened and maybe, maybe it won't happen for another 2,000 years. I couldn't imagine that, I just can't imagine that, but neither could the disciples. Our job is to stay alert and be ready and share the gospel. That's our job. I wanna, I wanna end for today with two passages from Mark chapter one. We started this in January. We did Mark 1.1 1, 1 in the first Sunday of the year. And here's what it said. I, I think it's really fun to go back and look at this in the context of what we just finished in Mark 13. Mark, the author of, the, of this gospel, Mark said this. This is the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the son of God. Everything that we've just studied is the good news. Even this last bit that Jesus is coming back, it's good news. It's good news for those who are saved. It's good news for those who have trusted Jesus for salvation. It's bad news for everybody else. 
This is the good news about Jesus the Messiah. And the Jesus himself said in verse 15, the time promised by God has come at last. That was the first coming of Jesus. We've been studying in Mark 13, the second coming of Jesus, but the first coming already happened. Jesus came in the incarnation. The time is promised by God has come at last. Jesus announced the kingdom of God is near. And so here was his message, and it's our message too. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. I wanna finish our study of, of the gospel of Mark for this year. I wanna finish it just by sharing the gospel with all of you. So for those of you who have already responded to the good news and have already trusted Jesus for salvation, then just let this be a, an example for what you should do in your lives. But there might be some of you here today who haven't yet responded in faith to Jesus. You haven't yet trusted Jesus for salvation. And I wanna give you a chance. I wanna give you an opportunity to do that today. It seems fitting that that's how we finish our study of the gospel of Mark for the year. It's to share the good news. Here it is, really simple. The good news is this. It starts with bad news that you and I are broken, we're sinners, we're lost, we're desperate. We need to be saved, we need to be rescued because, because the, the penalty of our sin is death and we're gonna have to die it. We're gonna have to pay that penalty. The Bible says that every single one of us is a sinner and we owe God a death. But here's what Jesus did. This is the good news. Jesus lived his perfect sinless life fully God, fully man. He went to the cross. He died on the cross in our place and then he rose from the dead three days later to prove that he has dominion over death and hell and the grave. But here's what the Bible says. Here's the good news. And Jesus says it right here. Repent and believe. That's the formula for being ready for his second coming is to repent and believe. Repent means to turn from our way of living and to look at Jesus and say, I wanna go your way now. It's an attitude change, that's repentance. And believing is trusting that what Jesus did paid the full debt for us, that we can't add anything to it. And the Bible says when we do that, when we repent and believe, the Bible says that we're children of God. We cross over from being children of wrath to being children of God, and then we don't have to, we don't have to worry about it. We don't have to wonder if we've done enough. We don't, we don't have to be afraid that when we show up at home someday and we see a pile of clothes there sitting on the couch that we missed it because we won't miss it because it's not about you. It's about what Jesus did. That's the good news. That's the good news that Jesus came to preach. We talk about this more in our pursuit series and I wanna encourage you to go through it with somebody if you've never gone through it before. But today to close our time together, I wanna, I wanna just pray and I wanna give you an opportunity if you've never if you've never repented and believed, then I wanna give you an opportunity to do that even right now. So would you bow your heads with me? Close your eyes. And if that's you today and you would say, I, you know, I, I, I'm not, I, I don't know if I'm ready for Jesus' second coming. I don't, know, I don't know if I'd be left behind or not. You don't have to wonder. If today you wanna trust in Jesus for salvation, then I invite you to pray a prayer just in your own heart, a simple prayer like this. Just say, God, I recognize I'm broken, that I'm a sinner, that I deserve your judgment. But today I wanna turn from my sins and I wanna turn to you in faith. Jesus, I believe that you are God and that you died the death that I owed on the cross and that you rose from the dead. And today I put all of my hope in that. Today I profess my faith in the finished work of Jesus. And I receive your forgiveness and your salvation. In Jesus' name, amen.